Well, I think we'll get going here and everyone is welcome to turn their video on and so we can at least be a little more social here. But tonight's program is with um, JC Arndt and she's new to the University of Wyoming Extension and she's done some research on invasive grasses up in the northeast part of Wyoming. And so there's some real interesting grasses trying to creep into Wyoming and, and I think it's important that we're aware of them and we know that they're out there and be on the lookout for them. I think importantly, really be on the lookout for these grasses that we don't want and, and some of them we truly don't want. If we think cheatgrass is bad, there's some out there that make cheatgrass look good. But again, you guys are all welcome to, I, we've all got enough bandwidth tonight and you're welcome to turn on your video and, and partake and watch what's going on. But again, I want to welcome everyone to the University of Wyoming Laramie County Extension's gardening series. And, and again, uh, JC, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank so you, thanks Catherine. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you guys for joining in. Uh, I'm excited to share a little bit about uh, rangeland invasive species. Uh, I have a little presentation I put together just to help with some of the information. Um, but feel free at any time if you have a question or you want a little bit more information just stop me and we can talk about it a little bit more. Uh, but in general, um, as Catherine just said, I just started as an extension educator with UW. Um, and part of my role is also being coordinator for the Northeast Wyoming Invasive Grasses Working Group. Uh, and that deals primarily with two annual invasive grasses in Northeast Wyoming, Medusa Head and Ventanata. So, I'll talk about that a little bit today too. Uh, but to get things started, uh, I just wanted to go over some identification of some common invasive grasses for Wyoming. Uh, the first I'm sure you guys are familiar with is cheatgrass, Bromus tectorum. It's a nasty little plant, winter annual, uh, that's relatively small, has flat leaves. Uh, the leaves and stems are very hairy. So if it doesn't have that seed head, uh, inflorescence. You can usually identify it just by that very hairy stem. Uh, there's very thin ligule as you can see from this photo and uh, it has a nodding inflorescence which means uh, that inflorescence kind of tips over especially you can see it blowing in the wind. It has very straight awns that are uh, quite uh, pokey and that can cause a lot of injury to grazers. So it's kind of a pain in rangelands. And at the bottom of that, I have a picture of the distribution of cheatgrass within uh, North America. As you can see, it's completely widespread. If we look a little bit more specifically at um, an EDDS map, uh, this shows um, the number of reports of cheatgrass within each county in the US. So you can kind of see where um, some states may show up that cheatgrass is all over, but it's not actually. And then you can see, especially in the West here, uh, cheatgrass density is a lot worse and there's a lot more reports of cheatgrass. Uh, the next one is Ventanata. Uh, you may not be as familiar with this species because it's new to Wyoming. Uh, it was discovered originally actually in 1997, but it kind of went unnoticed for a while. Uh, except for a herbarium sample that was collected in 1997. And then it was found again in Sheridan County in 2016. And since then, there's been a lot of efforts to um, control and eradicate the species. It's also a winter annual, uh, very small stature plant. It uh, turns a very shiny blonde color later in the season. So it's very easy to see, like uh, if you're driving down the road, you can see that shiny color as it matures. It also has very dark nodes and a very long distinguished ligule. Uh, this open panicle makes it pretty easy to identify. And if that isn't enough, it has a pretty peculiar on that uh, has a small twist on the bottom half of it and then is usually bent at about a hundred degree angle. Uh, it grows in low pre or actually a little bit higher precipitation zones than cheatgrass. And unfortunately it can replace cheatgrass uh, when it invades an area. Unfortunately, it also has an extremely high silica content, which means it's a worse forage uh, than cheatgrass. So you can see uh, currently Vetnata is only located in 
uh, Sheridan, Johnson, and Campbell County in Wyoming. And uh, with the group I'm part of, we're trying to um, contain that invasion just to those three counties. But it's important to keep an eye out for the species throughout the rest of the state because it could easily spread and we want to be on top of it if it does spread. Another one you may not be as familiar with is Medusa head, uh, also a winter annual, fairly small statured. It has slightly hairy leaves and um, the most identifying characteristic is these long barbed awns and they usually occur in two lengths. So towards the bottom the awns are a little bit shorter and then at the top they're a little bit longer. So it actually kind of resembles Medusa uh, with the snakes in her hair basically. Uh, it grows in pretty low precipitation zones. Again, has a very high silica content, which makes it a poor forage grass. Can also harm grazers because it has these long barbed awns and it too can replace cheatgrass. Now I add this uh, distribution map from NRCS that shows that it's not currently in Wyoming, but this just gives you a point that uh, when you're looking at grass distribution maps, uh, sometimes they're not always right because in fact, <laughs> Medusa head is located in Wyoming, uh, but currently only in Sheridan County. Uh, so this is another one where we need to be careful and keeping a close eye out for Medusa head within the state. I also want to point out field brome, uh, also much more common in the state of Wyoming. It's a winter annual, uh, has very dense leaves that are very hairy, as you can see from this photo. Uh, again, it has an nodding inflorescence, much like cheatgrass. Um, Interestingly, it's commonly used as a winter cover crop in the Northeast, but in the West, it is highly invasive and displaces desirable vegetation. Uh, this is a distribution map of field brome. As you can see, it's pretty broadly distributed through the US, so it's everywhere. Uh, now this last one is actually a perennial invasive grass, and it's just kind of recently become uh, a problem as far as invasive species go. It was originally a turf grass uh, introduced into the West, but it failed as a turf grass and has now such uh, turned into a pretty big invader. It's a bunch grass, it's very shallow rooted, uh, grows a, as far as we can tell on all soil textures. And the interesting thing about bulbous bluegrass is that instead of reproducing by seed, it produces these tiny, uh, Oops, sorry. It produces these tiny bulbs and that's actually how it reproduces. Um, it creates these bulbs on the inflorescence, those fall and that's where the new plants come from. So it's a little bit different. Uh, it's got a little bit less distribution throughout the United States, but it is a pretty uh, common species throughout the uni United States. So just kind of to compare all of these species a little bit, as you can see, cheatgrass and field brome have that nodding inflorescence, very hairy leaves, um, Medusa head, pretty obvious inflorescence here, and slightly hairy leaf, um, but not of that very open panicle. And then bulbous is very easily distinguished by that obvious bulblet rather than a seed. And that's just another picture a little bit closer up of a seedling. So you can see, especially with cheatgrass and field brome, that's very hairy even at the seedling stage. So if you don't have an inflorescence, it's still fairly easy to identify them. So why do we care about invasive grasses? Because uh, they have pretty huge impacts on rangelands. Uh, they have massive, they can cause massive forage loss uh, just by um, annual grasses being short statured when they occur, they naturally have less forage available. And then especially when we look at Medusa head and Bentonata, that high silica content makes uh, their forage quality even lower. Uh, it also decreases desirable wildlife habitat uh, just by being present on the rangelands uh, that the habitat that wildlife need can be replaced. Um, it could make sites more susceptible to other weeds by basically changing uh, soil cover and health and altering the ecosystem altogether. Uh, invasive grasses, especially uh, winter annuals, are known for altering fire regimes. Uh, so originally you could say a sagebrush community only burns every 50 to 100 years on average, but when invasive grasses enter those ecosystems, you see uh, the fire return interval drop more around uh, every one to five years. So it can really change ecosystems that way too. And of course, uh, 
invasive grasses decrease, uh, decrease biodiversity overall. So that's not good. Uh, basically, we can look at ecosystem goods and services. That's basically anything good that comes from an ecosystem. As annual grass abundance increases, uh, those ecosystem goods and services decrease. So annual grasses or invasive grasses in general, not a good thing. Uh, when it comes to actually managing invasive grasses, we also need to pay attention to where they're at on the invasion curve. Uh, so basically there's four stages of invasion, prevention, eradication, containment, and long-term control. Uh, prevention being where we want to stop a species from entering. So basically having certified weed-free hay, uh, cleaning equipment properly so that you don't introduce a species into a new site, um, even being as careful as not collecting a grass while you're on vacation and bring it home. Uh, that seed could easily be spread. Eradication is the next part where uh, if there's a small population, you may be able to um, treat that population and completely eradicate it. Sometimes then you have to move into containment where uh, if there is more of a distribution of the species, you're basically just trying to keep it within an area so that it doesn't cause uh, any damage to outside rangelands. And then there's long-term control where an invasive species is so widespread and abundant that it's basically financially impossible to treat all of the populations. So you just try to manage them as best as possible to get um, the best suppression and also uh, the best resource out of it. Uh, so as you go along in this invasion curve, uh, the cost of management or control increases. So it's easiest to go with prevention or eradication rather than being stuck with long-term control. Uh, luckily with Ventnata and Medusa head for Wyoming, uh, we're still in this early area where with Ventnata, we're trying to contain it within uh, Sheridan, Johnson and Campbell County. And with Medusa head, we're actually working on uh, eradicating it within Sheridan County and doing a lot of prevention as far as um, preventing it from entering other parts of the state. Now, unfortunately, with cheatgrass, field brome, and bulbous bluegrass, uh, they're already widespread throughout the state. And at this point, we're just looking at long-term long control of these species. So a couple of management options. I'm gonna go through uh, three major management options that we can have for invasive grasses. Uh, so these herbicides are for annual grass management. Um, they don't necessarily work for bulbous bluegrass. And because bulbous is like uh, new to our radar, we don't actually know what works best for managing bulbous yet. Uh, there is a graduate student with the University of Wyoming that's working on this project and hopefully we'll have a better idea of how to control bulbous here shortly. Uh, but as you can see, there's quite a few options for annual grass herbicides to control uh, cheatgrass, field brome, medusa head, and bentonata. Uh, this table here comes from uh, the cheatgrass management handbook and uh, it was actually published in 2013 and just since then two of the herbicides that were known to treat cheat, uh, cheatgrass are no longer viable options uh, because they didn't really work so I mean just in seven years we have already lost two of our options uh, but luckily uh, within the last couple years we found a new one which is indazaflam um, sold initially as Esplanade and now as Rejuvra. And you apply this in the early fall as a pre-emergent herbicide. And we're seeing, interestingly enough, up to three to four years of control with indazaflam um, because it remains in the top about an inch of the soil and prevents uh, future seeds from emerging. So it's showing to be a pretty good herbicide option. Uh, as you can see, there are other options available out there too. And I have some pictures of some of those options. Uh, so Plateau is one of them. That is uh, Imazepic. So this was a site treated in October of 2016 and then evaluated the next year. And you can see a pretty distinct difference uh, where the non-treated, um, primarily this is Ventnata uh, and a little bit of cheatgrass dispersed throughout it. And within a year, Plateau is pretty successful at uh, controlling that grass. Uh, so, here's another, sorry, go ahead. 
I do have a question for you on that. Um, the one herbicide Esplanade that mm -hmm. had like a three year life. I know that with Plateau, you can't go back in and try to reseed for a whole year after you've used Plateau. Is Esplanade the same way? Uh, yeah, so, well, we don't know for sure yet. So with Endazaflam, uh, it remains in that top basically inch, but it doesn't damage the existing perennial vegetation. So I can show you this picture is actually uh, an Esplanade treatment where it's only preventing that seed crop of annual grasses to come up, but the perennial grasses that are rooted below that depth are okay. Um, as far as reseeding, uh, there's another graduate student with the University of Wyoming that was actually in my lab. She's still working on it. Um, and she is studying different seeding depths to see if we can seed below that um, soil level and still get emergence of perennial grasses, even with an endazaflam treatment. But if you seed within that zone of treatment, then uh, reseeding is not really an option. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, this is another treatment. And then this is another Esplanade treatment. So this kind of goes into the same story. Um, this site was pretty heavily invaded by Medusa head. And after treatment, you can see pretty successful control of the annual grass. But unfortunately, there's not, I mean, the only existing perennial vegetation is mostly forbs. Uh, so reseeding would probably be um, the next step for this site but we need to figure out which species uh, and what depths would work in order to reseed because there is um, residual herbicide within that soil. So it's a work in progress and we're getting there because it's relatively new herbicide. Another management option is prescribed fire. Uh, basically this one works by decreasing the seed that's available. Uh, it also removes litter and basically uh, the thatch layer, uh, the litter layer, can sometimes protect seeds and prevent them from being uh, destroyed, desiccated, or even eaten by like mice. Um, so by removing that litter layer, you can actually increase the destruction of those seeds and also improve herbicide application if you want to use the two in conjunction. I do have to throw a cautionary flag up because sometimes fire leads to an increase in annual grasses if it's done at the wrong time or the wrong severity. And it's also not suitable for sagebrush ecosystems because uh, you'll eradicate your sagebrush and it takes a lot longer to come back after fire than an annual grass does. So fire is an option as long as it's uh, very carefully thought out beforehand. And there's some more information on that within uh, the cheatgrass management handbook, which I have um, a link for later on this. So JC, why is why is the sage sagebrush so important? Well, uh, we know that sagebrush is important for sage grouse habitat primarily. That's kind of the big reason we keep sagebrush, uh, especially in Wyoming, protecting those core areas. But it's also important for other bird species, um, mule deer habitat, even elk will use sagebrush in the um, in the winter. And it's also sagebrush create uh, basically these islands of fertility around them that are pretty beneficial for other desirable perennial vegetation. So sagebrush is important for our ecosystem in general. Uh, another management option is to do targeted grazing. Uh, for cheatgrass and field brum, and bulbous bluegrass, uh, you can graze early in the season when these species are very small and they can actually be have some forage value and palatability. Uh, but you have to carefully manage a balance between effectively using uh, those species to decrease them and not overgrazing your site and actually causing more damage to the area. Unfortunately, targeted grazing doesn't appear to be a very viable option with Medusa head and Ventnata because their forage quality is so low that most grazers purposefully avoid them. So you have to be careful with that one too. Uh, but I do have some data from a project that Karen Noseworthy and Brian Mueller did a couple years ago on uh, cheatgrass grazing. They did two years of treatment prior to this, these results. Uh, so basically there was uh, 
an ungrazed and untreated herbicide treated check, a fall grazing, a spring grazing, a spring and fall grazing treatment, and then two um, herbicide treatments. And they found that fall grazing basically had little impact, which makes sense because a lot of those seeds are either developed or uh, these invasive grasses are pretty unpalatable by that time. So the grazers are probably avoiding them. Uh, there was a decrease in sheet grass biomass and seed production with using spring grazing and spring and fall. Uh, it doesn't completely reduce the cheat grass, but it causes less of it basically. And they found that animal type didn't matter. So they were think we're using cattle and sheep and there was no difference between the two. So that kind of gives you an idea that grazing may be another piece that you could put into managing cheat grass or other annual grasses. Um, so this also comes from the Cheatgrass uh, Management Handbook. And basically, I've gone through a lot of this, um, identifying the invasive species, and then uh, figuring out what treatment works best for um, your level of invasion. But even after you have a treatment, you need to go back into that site and monitor and make sure what you're doing is working. And if it's not, uh, reassessing the situation, maybe looking at different treatment options. If you do by chance uh, eradicate a species from a site, then uh, you go into this prevention loop where you prevent a uh, new seed from being introduced and then go from there. So, uh, as I said before, um, coordinator for the Northeast Wyoming Invasive Grasses Working Group. Uh, and this is basically what we did. A lot of what I just talked about, um, that not and Medusa head were both identified in Sheridan County in 2016. So uh, this group was made to minimize the impacts of Medusa head and Ventanata in Northeast Wyoming. Basically, we work with a lot of different uh, partners, um, local, state, national organizations, private landowners. Uh, the University of Wyoming clearly is involved uh, to control these species. So basically what we did is go out and monitor. Uh, this is um, Sheridan County, basically. And we went out and monitored, uh, I think it was 36,000 acres of land to find all the Medusa head populations. Um, and then we treated uh, these colors are different treatments that we created of uh, herbicide since 2016. Uh, so there's been uh, like 36,000 acres treated, primarily focusing on eradicating Medusa head, but some of those treatments also have Ventanata within them as well. Um, so yeah, we've been surveying and controlling uh, Medusa head within this smaller area of Sheridan County. And then Ventanata is within this purple block. And we've been working with landowners to basically uh, block up Ventanata treatments and also prevent um, that not for moving outside of this containment zone. So right now it's just within uh, Sheridan, Johnson, and Campbell County, as you can see here. And we're trying to make sure that it doesn't go any further than that. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of groups with this. Uh, the best way to manage invasive grasses is through uh, community effort, right? Uh, this project that we're doing is pretty novel uh, for the amount of people that we have involved and that are actually cooperating together in order to eradicate Medusa head and control Ventanata within Wyoming. So it takes a pretty um, concentrated effort from a lot of different stakeholders to get something like this done. Uh, that was pretty quick, kind of a flash by of invasive grasses. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to go back and talk about some other stuff, but Thank you. I also have to say, if you do happen to see Ventanata or Medusa head uh, in other places of Wyoming, feel free to contact me. Uh, I left my email up there. Um, you can also contact any of your Wien Pest uh, County offices and they will probably get back to me as well. But keep an eye out for those. And all I can say is good luck in the fight against invasive species. So thank you, JC. That was wonderful. And it's, it's good to know that there's such a concentrated effort out there and that it's not being ignored because, 
you know, when we should have been paying attention to cheatgrass and trying to eradicate that or control it, we weren't. And, you know, Nevada, the state of Nevada is a great test case for that, where they've had just cheatgrass fires that are, take over the whole state practically. And, and there's parts of Colorado that are almost nothing but cheatgrass. Um, the Sterling area of Colorado has got just miles, miles of cheatgrass. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of a daunting task to even think about cheatgrass. It's, I mean, it's a constant battle. And fortunately with Medusa Head, we're seeing really good responses where, where we haven't eradicated it, but we're getting a lot closer to it every day. So it feels a lot better to start something this early on than yeah. be lost with cheatgrass. Yeah, being behind, so far behind the curve with cheatgrass is frustrating. and. I've, uh, I've sprayed, what, last year we had the perfect storm and it was 46 degrees, almost all spring, wet spring, cool, man, that cheatgrass just exploded. It was, yeah. it was a happy, it was a happy camper, nothing else was. So what, what are the ideal conditions for these two grasses, the Ventanata and um, the Medusa head for germination? What do they, what do they like? Uh, so it's pretty similar to cheatgrass, uh, primarily in the fall time. So uh, we're looking at, uh, basically they both senesce by July and then come September, October, when you have that 40, 50 degree weather with a little bit of rain, uh, that fall emergence, it's what is really bad for these, or really good for those species, but bad for us. Um, and then uh, that nada actually requires a little bit more precipitation. Uh, we see it a lot more often on south facing slopes and in drainages. So it appears to be a little bit more water loving than cheatgrass. So it needs a little bit more. Uh, Medusa head on the other hand, honestly, it's behaving pretty similarly to cheatgrass, uh, except it requires even less water and it appears to be out competing it in most. So like you said, uh, last year was kind of the perfect storm with that wet spring, but last, uh, the fall before was also pretty wet and warm. And imagine what you saw with cheatgrass, but we were seeing fields of uh, cheatgrass, field brome, medusa head, and ventnata all growing happily together, very large, so. Wow, did you, did you wanna like burn the field? <laughs> <laughs> right, you want to a little class. bit. Burn the field. Yeah. Some of them you feel that way, but it's also pretty amazing because we've had some of the treatments up here where, um, I mean, it was depressing to look at the amount of ventnata that was there. I mean, I have a picture of how, maybe if it'll let me, of how bad the ventnata is. I mean, you wouldn't really think there's that much recovery potential here, but once we treat it, um, there's a lot of Western wheatgrass and other native perennial grasses that were there. So that's, initially. Yeah, that's been my understanding with treating and using plateau on cheatgrass is that there's really a lot of stuff that's still there that's gonna come back. And so I'm watching one of my fields very carefully because I didn't treat this year because it, we just really haven't had that that opportunity, at least I haven't, you know, where it really hasn't been cool and moist enough and, and maybe I've missed the, the, the window. So I'm gonna watch for it in the spring and see what goes on. But <laughs> interestingly, up at, um, in uh, Lingle at the research station there, the UW research station, that whole bunch of test plots, there was a little challenge on how to control cheatgrass. And so each test pot was kind of small like 50 feet by 100 feet and they did different types of grazing different types of chemicals and the farm manager came in with his test plot hit it all with roundup and then replanted that next spring with um intermediate wheatgrass <laughs> it did was the best of everything mm -hmm. i remember it yeah i was an intern for uh the sharon research station i actually helped collect data on that project yeah, yeah it was like a couple of them that seemed like they probably thought out of the process the best. They basically had like a moonscape plot. It's very tricky and it all depends on the year too. Like this year's been really dry and we've seen less invasive grasses because 
they don't have enough water either. <laughs> so, so in, in the just in your lecture, you talked about shallow rooted grasses. Why mm -hmm. why is that important? The shallow being shallow rooted. Uh, you know, well, I guess uh, with bulbous, it doesn't exactly make as much sense with it being a perennial. You would think it would try to reach further down to access water source from further below. With annual grasses, they're growing so rapidly that they don't focus a lot of energy into growing their roots. They just grow up, produce seed, and then die, basically. Um, so that's kind of the ad advantage for annual grasses. Uh, with bulbous, that's the weird one because with it being a perennial, you'd expect it to have um, a more prominent root, but it doesn't. And we don't really know what the advantage of that is at the moment because it's, like I said, kind of just new on the radar of being a problem species. Okay. So, you know, I, I do a lot of yard calls and I go out to the county and I do a lot of county calls and then um, of course, the conservation district, they also do that. And, and so I'm assuming that you're, you're trying to pull conservation districts in and get them educated on this grass. But what, what do we tell homeowners that, that have, you know, the 10 acre or the 40 acre plot, you know, and most of them want to just either mow it or graze it. And then, and then when that person leaves, they, they leave a mess behind that's, that's very hard for that land to recover from. And so it's a weedy mess. What's, what is your advice for this? It's because I, I confront this every year. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess, I don't, depending on which species you're working with, the best we can do is educate as much as possible um, and make it easier for people to contact people like me or other uh, rangeland extension educators. But also, as far as like actual treatment, if I, if my brother called me and he saw Ventnata popping up in his 10 acre land, I'd tell him to go pull it. I mean, if there's small enough populations of it, rather than burning or mowing um, for that species, I'd say pull it, burn it in a contained area and get rid of it before that's in a problem. But I mean, as populations get bigger, it becomes more difficult. Um, like the cheatgrass management handbook is 160 pages of managing just cheatgrass yes. at, in different scenarios. And I mean, I could tell you a lot of different ways to manage it depending on your level of invasion. I mean, what other perennials are there? Like what your goals are? There's so many different directions to go that it's hard to give one solid answer. <laughs> So you're, you're just really at the beginning research stages with these two grasses. And so I, I'm sure you're trying to figure out what type of soil they're, they're happy in. It probably doesn't matter. They'll probably grow on a sidewalk. It's like cheap grass, you know. A little bit. So, so a, lot, a lot of unanswered questions and a lot more research needs to go into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's currently uh, five of us up at the Sheridan Research Extension Center and all of our projects have pertained to these two species. So, I mean, it's up and coming within just the state and we're trying to learn a lot as fast as we can for these two species. So there's more information to come, hopefully positive. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's hard enough um, trying to have pasture for your animals and, and, and really be a good steward of the land and, and rotate and not overgraze. But then to have something, you know, cheatgrass is, is daunting enough to try to deal with. But if you've got something that outcompetes cheatgrass, that, that really makes it very, very difficult. And unfortunately, you know, down here in Laramie County, there's like 4,500 small acreage parcels out here. And they all work off urban myth of, you know, graze it or mow it to prevent fire hazard. And, and yet they, they're creating exactly that, a fire hazard by, by believing it, buying into that myth. And then of course, there's always the bad advice out there. So it's, it's a challenge. And I guess that the more information you can get out, <laughs> the easier it makes my job. 
Well, that's hopefully, I mean, that's what my position is built for. And hopefully I can get more and more into that as I get more into uh, the UW community and keep doing things like that. Hopefully we can get everybody educated that mowing and burning is not always the best option. And there's other options out there. Yep, absolutely. So anyone else have any questions? Again, you're welcome to um, turn your video on and, and it doesn't have to be JC and myself. So you're welcome to join us. If you have questions, um, you can put it in the chat box by all means, or, you know, turn your mic on and ask the question, but, you know, jump in and, and if you have questions, please, this is time to get them answered. If you have questions about cheatgrass control or, you know, anything. What about grass that control. yellow clover? How about yellow clover? One that was in the background. I see it all the way up to North Dakota. Mm hmm Yeah, it's all over the place. Um, I don't actually know what to tell you on that one because I haven't dealt with it very much yet. Uh, Brian, it's a, it's a biannual legume. It's got a very deep taproot. I've, I've dug them up. It's a very deep taproot. The taproot probably goes uh, two feet. And so it's, it's every other year. And it's, it's actually widely planted and put in a lot of pollinator habitats. It's um, North Dakota and South Dakota, their, their beekeepers rely on that. That's where that sweet clover honey comes from. So it's, it's uh, if you're trying to get rid of it, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> you can go out and spot spray it with, with Roundup, but that, that may be daunting. Oh, I didn't know if it was beneficial or if, or if it was invasive or. Well, it's, it's, it's not, it's considered a colonizer and it actually helps make the way for other good plants to come in. Mm -hmm. that, at least that's my understanding. JC might have. Yeah, know. as far as, I mean, it depends on who you talk to for some of it. Some people see it as highly desirable, like I said, with pollinators and hay crops. Um, it seems like more often now people are a little bit more negative about it. I wouldn't say it's invasive by any means, but people are starting to have more and more issues with it. Yeah, it's, it, it puts nitrogen back into the soil. It helps hold the soil in place. My gosh, after, you know, you're what, uh, you're up in Sheridan. Down here, we had a windstorm. And Casper had 100 mile an hour winds. We had like 60 mile an hour winds down here. And I watched, went down the road and I watched a neighbor's topsoil blow away. It literally went 500 feet into the air. And having a cover clop like the, the yellow sweet clover, the white sweet clover, Brian, would have helped hold that soil and he would have not lost his top inch. I, I'm sure someone, some housewife and carpenter has gone, <laughs> oh look, <laughs> top soil. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. And more so up here, I mean, we're in a little bit higher of a precip zone, a lower elevation. Um, so we don't, I mean, the perennial grasses that are growing up here are a little bit better at covering the ground on their own. So some people see sweet clover as just competing with the perennial grasses up here, but it depends on where you're at. It could be a good thing and it could be a bad thing. I have no problem with it, but it depends on who you're talking to. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Now's the time to, to jump in. No questions, too small. <laughs> so JC, what's next on your, on your list of things to do as far as grass goes? Uh, uh, we're actually starting a project this fall. Um, so after all of the treatments went out on, um, basically from 2016 to 2020, uh, we're collecting soil samples to see how long endazoflam is actually remaining in the soil. Uh, so we're gonna do some greenhouse experiments with that and see if that three year residual is actually occurring. And then um, this year we did um, 
as far as I know, the largest monitoring effort that's been done on an invasive treatment before. So basically we went out to all of those treatments and collected um, cover of all of the invasive species and uh, perennial grass and we're creating reports of that to uh, present at future meetings and also give back to the landowners that are involved in our project. Uh, those are my two big tasks right now, but uh, there's a lot of other projects going on with the research station and I try to kind of jump around and see what everybody's doing at the same time. Great. Well, that's, uh, it's ongoing and I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a lifetime of research up there on this, trying to control that because we, we don't need that problem. We don't need more, more bad news down here. Again, any other questions, thoughts, comments? This is Rick in Laramie County. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Go ahead, Rick. Is anybody working on the genetics aspects of some of these weeds? I know that's more complicated, but that's probably the only way we'll ever get rid of them. I border the research station, so I've seen a lot of work being done just south of me, but uh, the, it's the five and 10 acre lots that are killing me because they, the, their seed just blow into my pasture. Right, uh, yeah, especially, um, I've gone to a couple weed science conferences and especially more into like Washington and Oregon where these species have been established, uh, Medusa and Ventnata for more like 20, 30 years. Um, there's a lot deeper information going into it. Uh, right now, and Dazaflame is kind of like the big deal and everybody's mostly doing research on um, how well and is working or how long the residual is. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, but I think we're just starting to get into the genetic aspect of that and it's gonna get bigger and bigger from here on out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Well, the program has been recorded. So if you know of anyone that wants to learn more about invasive grasses and this grass goes, um, the Laramie County Extension website will have that. And then I'll also pass it along to the Laramie County Master Gardeners for their website for access there. So it'll be available in a couple locations. Any other questions? Last call for questions. <laughs> uh, thank you all for listening to my spiel. Um, it's, I mean, I guess we're all kind of in the fight against invasive species and uh, hopefully something good comes of it someday. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, JC, thank you for your time. And thanks for taking out time from your evening and I wish you good luck up there in Sheridan. And everyone who joined us tonight, thank you. And stay tuned, I'm sure I'll come up with more fun topics. So everyone have a good night and uh, stay safe and healthy. Good night, everyone. <laughs>